look at holding your eternity passport. Who can tell me what this is? What am I holding here in my hand? Passport. It is a passport. It says passport right there. This is an American, United States of America passport, right? And if you are leaving America going to some other country, this is an extremely important document. You do not want to lose it. You do not want to forget where you put it, right? Um, hands up if you have your own passport. Anybody here? Oh, all right, good deal, right? So when you travel to other countries, your passport is far more valuable than your driver's license is when you're here in the country, right? I, you know, when, you, when, the, when the policeman pulls you over, what's he going to ask for? Your ID, driver's license, oh no, he asked for a driver's license and your insurance card, right? So, um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's like when you're traveling to another country, I mean, if you, in some countries, if you don't have a passport, well, they don't like your passport, right? They, they'd lock you up or take you or put you in the hoose cow, right? So your passport is a super official record of who you are, right? Of what you looked like years ago when they took the photograph, right? Which, if it's, if it's a long time ago photograph, you probably don't look like that anymore. And most importantly, the places you have been visiting. Now, why is that important? Well, if your passport shows that you regularly fly in and out of Moscow, Russia, the American officials will want to talk to you in the back room when, when you come back home, right? What have you been doing in Russia, right? Our big question is, do people need a passport to get into the kingdom of God. What do you think? Do people need a passport to get into the kingdom? Spiritual. A spiritual passport. Yeah, right on the money. So here's the answer from Jesus. Matthew 7, 21. Not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, all those who say to me, Lord Jesus, not everyone is going to enter the kingdom of God, but those who do the will of the Father in heaven, right? Those are going to go into the kingdom, right? What did Jesus say allows people to enter the kingdom? Those who have a record of doing the Father's will until death are the ones who get approved to enter God's kingdom. So all you have to be doing is the will of the Father. Well, they, how do you do that? Bible study, Bible reading, listening to messages, right? Learning as much as you can about the will of the Father, primarily from what Jesus taught and others. Jesus uses a separation process that examines each person's record of activities. Matthew 25, 32. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Verse 34. Then the king will say to those, the sheep, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. The sheep have a record, like a spiritual passport. And Jesus said, come on, you sheep, come on in to the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Now, the sheep people had records of serving others in the name of Christ. Verse 35, Matthew 25. For I was hungry and you gave me food. Later on, they're going to ask, when did we give you food? And he's going to answer, in that you gave it to somebody else in my name, you gave it to me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Your activity record in your spiritual passport showed that you, was a, you were a sheep and so you're going into the kingdom. So we know what happens to the sheep, but what happens to the goats? Verse 46. These, the goats, go away into, we're going to read slowly now, everlasting punishment. Why is that important? It's not the word everlasting punishing. It's the words everlasting punishment, which means 
the punishment, which is being dead forever, lasts forever. Once the punishment, the second death, happens, you never exist again. It lasts forever, right? You are not being punished forever, which is what two billion and many other billions have been taught, right? Go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous go into eternal life. So, what was wrong with the goats? Right? Jesus tells us, verse 40, 42, I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. And a little later on, they say, hold on a minute. We don't remember seeing you and not giving you food. And he said, ah, but you didn't give others food and drink in my name. You weren't serving me, right? So you go into everlasting punishment. You end up dead forever, second death. Humans who don't serve Christ during the thousand years that are coming up, the thousand year millennium of peace on earth, or in the hundred years of the second resurrection, will be the goats who perish for all eternity. Jesus expects his servants to give to others and to continually be increasing our talent and our fruit production. This is kind of amazing here when we look at this. Matthew 25, 16. Then he who received five talents went and traded, like Jesus told him, go trade. Right? He traded with them and he made another five talents. That's a pretty good increase, right? It's like, here's, a, here's 500 bucks, go trade and increase it. And he came back with a thousand bucks. He doubled it from trading. That was good. And his master said to him in verse 21, his Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Enter into the kingdom of God. Right? Now the next verse shows that Jesus was upset about zero increase. Right? You have to read it kind of slow. Verse 27 so you ought to have deposited my money. This is the guy, this is the guy that was given one talent and he wrapped it up in a napkin and he buried it in the ground. And when the boss came back, when Jesus came back, he unwrapped it and he said, "Here's your talent back. Exactly the same amount as you gave me and told me to go trade, but no increase." And Jesus said, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. They had bankers back then, 2,000 years ago, right? We've had bankers for a long time, right? And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Now, in today, what's the interest rate today? Anybody know? Anybody got a past savings account? <laughs> and they've got a CD, and they've got money and interest, right? It's pathetic, right? It's almost, it's almost nothing, but, you know, half a percent, maybe, whatever, right? But notice, Jesus appears to, that he would have been happy if he had just gotten the talent and a little bit of interest back, there would have been increase. And the guy with the one talent really wouldn't have had to do much of anything except think, my boss wants increase. I, I'm afraid of losing his talent. So I'll just put it with the bankers and when he comes back, I'll have the talent plus the accrued interest. And it appears that Jesus would have been happy with that. But he wasn't happy. Because all he got back was exactly what he gave in the first place. Jesus is looking for increase. Now, James shows that Jesus expects our faith to produce good works. James 2.17 Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, anybody think that dead faith is going to get them into the kingdom of God? It's not going to work. And that's what James is telling us. Right? I will show you my faith by my works. 
My works exemplify what kind of a faith I have. Verse 20. Do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead faith? Verse 22. Joel Osteen thinks that. There you go. There you go. Yeah, he wants you to send some money. Have faith and send him some money. Right? Do you not see that faith was working together with his works? They go hand in hand. If you trust and believe and rely on Jesus who says, go get me some works, work for me, your Lord and Master and King, right? Then by works, faith was made mature, right? So it's a, it's a two-part deal. You can't just say, well, I believe. And a lot of people believe they're going to heaven when they die. That's faith. They have faith they're going to heaven, right? But they haven't done the works of saying, here in Scripture is where I know I'm going to heaven because it's not there. Jesus warns believers about hearing Bible information and not producing Bible works and Bible fruits. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. I love, I love the Luke version of that because the guy gets out a shovel and he digs a trench down to the bedrock and he pours the foundations right into the bedrock. <laughs> and when the storm comes, his house doesn't get destroyed, right? So a solid passport record of doing for Jesus is building on the rock, right? So when the storms come, you don't lose everything. Sadly, billions are hearing vital information, but not being careful to be doing what Jesus is teaching. And we could show them, and, we, and Jesus teaches keep the Sabbath. And do most people keep the Sabbath? No. Does King Jesus say, yes, you should keep the Sabbath? Yes, he does. Most people go, well, Jesus, that got changed. Can you show me where it got changed? Can you show me who had the authority to change it? And I love, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible, I just thought of it. It says, pray that your flight at the abomination of desolation is not in the winter time. Because if you're going to flee into the mountains in the winter time, how are you going to fare up there in the mountains in the winter time? Not so good. He doesn't want you to have to suffer in the mountains first thing out of the gate in the winter time, which would be like outside today, right? But the second thing in that verse is, all oh, on the holy day, on the Sabbath day. So he's saying the abomination of desolation, which is yet ahead of us, you should be praying that it doesn't happen during the winter and it doesn't happen on a Sabbath, on a Friday night, Saturday night, Sabbath, holy day. You better know which is the day in the future when this happens. Otherwise, so, so what he just did is put his stamp on the Sabbath day for the next 2,000 years and it never changed. It's the seventh day. So everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. If you're not doing what I'm saying and teaching, you're like a foolish man who built his hand, house on the sand. Right? <clears throat> Now, most of us have been to the beach, right? And we've, we've walked barefoot on the beach and the water has washed up and we've left a footprint in the sand and then turned around and looked and the water just washed it away. It's back to flat sand again. Now, it's, it's in Luke it says, you build your house on the sand with no foundation. <laughs> No foundation. At least when we go to the beach, we see pylons, right? We see wood piles, or we see concrete piles, or we see metal piles down deep in below the sound level, and then they go up one story, sometimes two stories, and then you build your house on that which is founded way below the sound level. But Luke says, you build your house on the sand, with no foundation, <laughs> like what were you thinking, right? And the house of that fall, it says in verse 27, the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its 
fall. He's not talking about building houses. He's talking about spiritual lives. He's talking about your spiritual passport to go into heaven, yeah, not into heaven, but into God's heavenly kingdom on earth, right? And he's saying, you know, if you're listening to what I'm saying or, or you're hearing, you're hearing Bible words, but you're not really listening to the intent and understanding the intent, right? And then you're not doing what you have understood, then you're not having a record of doing what God wants you to do. John shows we need to be practicing and doing God's truth. 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. I love practice the truth. There's three words. Practice the truth. <laughs> right? What do you mean? Well, practice. You know what practice the piano means, don't you? Do you know what practice golf means? Do you know what practice swimming means? Do you know what practice tennis means? Okay, practice the truth. Well, then you've got to study the truth. You've got to find out what the truth is, and then you go practice the truth. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins which helps because we don't have a passport that has sins all over it. Our passport into God's kingdom needs to show a record of living and doing the will of the Father, which is the teachings of Jesus. The will of the Father is the same as practicing righteousness. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. And the word righteousness is so long. If you have to write it out, righteousness, it even sounds, oh, so holy righteousness. Just means doing the right thing. The truth is the right thing. Just do the right thing. Practice doing the right thing. Once we know what God expects, we need to hold tight, like we hold tight to our passport when we're entering another country, right? We hold tight to our habits of practicing God's truth. Paul urges us all to hold fast. 2 Timothy 1.13 Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me, Paul the teacher, in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Jesus uses the same language in Revelation 2.25 But hold fast what you have until I come, until you meet me. Verse 26 He who overcomes and keeps my works, what Jesus teaches to be works, until the end, to him will I give power over the nations. What does that mean? What does power over the nations mean? Your passport, your spiritual passport, just got you into the kingdom of God, into the eternal family of God. Christ could be king over all the earth, I think, in the next five to seven years. Would that make us happy? Would, would anybody be happy if Jesus was king over all the earth in the next five to seven years? And see, our weaponry moves much faster. And we're watching Russia, and they're not moving so fast, but they're using tanks and troops. Right? They're not destroying Ukraine. They're trying to capture Ukraine. Right? When you start destroying stuff, it doesn't take long. To destroy stuff, right? So, holding fast during World War III, which is ahead of us, and the tribulation, which is ahead of us, will be highly valuable because it will show on our spiritual passport that we stayed faithful, practicing the truth. After the tribulation, we won't need a passport since we will permanently be part of of God's family in the kingdom of God for all eternity.